Can I welcome everyone to the uh, 27th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Before we move to the main item of business, uh, there's one piece of business we've got to decide on, and that's uh, taking business in private. It's proposed we take items 5, 6 and 7 in private. These are consideration of delegated powers, provisions in bills, and of the evidence we're about to hear from the Minister on secondary legislation. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to agenda item two, and we've got before us uh, Graeme Day, uh, who is the new Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, to uh, welcome. Uh, he's going to provide us uh, with an update on the government's secondary legislation uh, programme. Uh, he's accompanied by Steve McGregor from the Parliament and Legislation Unit, uh, Colin Brown from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and Luke McBratney from the Constitution and UK Relations uh, Division. Minister, I believe you've got an opening statement. A, a brief one. Thank you, Convener. Um, obviously, this is my first time before the committee, and I, I very much welcome the opportunity to engage with yourselves, and I look forward to uh, working with you over the coming months. Um, this committee has a pivotal role in scrutinising the delegated powers which ministers and others are given through new acts uh, uh, and indeed using the use of existing powers. Uh, that, I suspect, can be a technical and laborious role at times, but it's an absolutely essential one and I commend the committee for the rigour it brings to the task. I say that both as a minister and someone who until quite recently was a convener of a committee uh, whose work was greatly aided by yours. The uh, standard of legislation brought forward by the government is generally high, but I fully accept that there can be exceptions to that. And I offer today an assurance that I'll always seek improvements in performance in this area and reflect the issues that are highlighted by this committee and others. Uh, in terms of the challenges coming down the track, clearly Brexit looms large. Uh, whilst the full legislative implications of that remain unclear, we can be certain that Brexit will require even better planning uh, quality assurance and explanation of the government's SSI programme. Uh, that's a challenge that Mr Russell and I are jointly tackling with officials. Um, and I think I'll leave it there, Convener, because I'm sure you've got a number of questions for me. Uh, yeah, we do, and uh, a lot of them relate to Brexit, as you might, you might imagine. Thanks, thanks very much for that. That's very useful. Um, so we'll go into the questions, and we'll start with Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister, and welcome to your new role. Um, certainly, Minister, um, can you provide the committee with an update on uh, any discussions that you're having with the UK government uh, on areas where the, the UK-wide approach to secondary legislation might actually be more appropriate? Do you want to give them, uh, give some detail? Yeah. Um, so those discussions are ongoing um, across the, the Scottish government. Um, you know, there's a, a protocol in place for a notification to be sent to the Scottish Parliament if the uh, Scottish Government is considering consenting to the UK government making provision in a statutory instrument. So the first notifications were sent at the end of, of last week. Um, and those discussions are taking place um, between individual uh, ministerial portfolios and the relevant departments. And we in the centre of the government are coordinating that work. And um, I mean, Luke might talk a little bit just about the, some of the criteria which um, underpin um, those discussions, but where there's an opportunity to work with the UK government to make um, corrections ahead of um, Brexit, then we're, we're looking at that as a, a viable option. The um, Scottish government recognises that we're dealing with a programme of legislation arising from EU withdrawal, both the notifications being issued in relation to UK SIs and SSIs in the Scottish Government that will be of an unprecedented level of scale, pace and complexity. We also want to protect as much parliamentary and governmental time as possible for non-Brexit related legislation. We have therefore, as Stephen um, indicates, um, agreed uh, uh, an approach with the UK Government where we will be able to consent to uh, legislation being made in devolved areas by them. The Minister wrote to the convener of this committee and to the convener of the Constitution Committee last week to set out the rationale for the government taking this approach. Um, thank you for that, Min. Mr McGregor, you just mentioned there uh, regarding the consent notifications uh, from uh, last week. Uh, and you also mentioned uh, the issue of um, having dialogue uh, to 
potentially uh, change if there was a particular issue? How, how, how is that dialogue uh, going? Have you found any has been any particular problems thus far? Um, it's still I mean, early, early days. Still early said. days, um, but sort of give a flavour of it. And we have regular discussion um, with colleagues in cabinet office and, and DEXU about this process and there is a very high level awareness within the UK government about the need for the Scottish Parliament to be able to scrutinise um, these notifications and they are building that into their timescales um, as best they can. So we're not we're continually trying to get more information about what SIC UK government is working on. We're trying to get as much um, draft um, information as we can in order to, to provide the Parliament with as much information at an earliest point as we possibly can. And I think that's reflected in the fact, um, the success of that so far is reflected in the fact that we've been able to send some notifications at the end of, of last week, which is enabling the Scottish Parliament to see what's coming through the pipeline effectively a whole month ahead of these instruments getting laid in the UK Parliament. So the process we put in place has given us a, a very early indication of what the UK government's planning to do. We'd like to know more. We'd like to, to know more earlier, and we just have to continue that dialogue with the UK government to get as much information as we can. It's essentially between September and November will be the period where the bulk of the notifications come through. Um, we anticipate right now, and this is a moving feast, uh, around about 110 Brexit SSIs. Now, there'll be, those will be contained within about 30 to 50 notifications. So the notifications will go out September and November. As Stephen says, some of those have gone out already. Then November to De December will be when the material starts to emerge, running through to March. Um, we're aware, obviously, of the last laying dates. Um, we will be doing everything we can to meet those, but we certainly cannot guarantee that there won't be some last-minute ones. Um, that's essentially where we are at the moment. Uh, obviously, I mean, the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, touched upon the, the notifications uh, last week in his statement uh, in the Chamber, um, and I think your, your answer there has been, has been quite helpful. But I think it might be quite useful if, um, if you could... Uh, Certainly, uh, come back to the committee. I even write to the committee on a regular basis, just in terms of how that's uh, how that's progressing. Because, uh, as, as you said yourself, there it is a moving feast. I, I think that's uh, that's a very good uh, point, and I'm happy to commit to that because I think it's essential that we work very closely with this committee and the others at the Parliament uh, to work our way through this process. Um, and I would obviously also welcome um, if uh, members have views on the nature of the notifications, the details that are contained within them. I'm happy to take uh, those any suggestions away to look at that because we're, we're in the business of trying to provide you with as much advance notice and information as we possibly can to, to smooth the way for your work to take place. Well, I mean, just on that point, the, the issue of the, the heavy legislative uh, lifting uh, has been discussed in the past and uh, as the consent notifications will be considered by the subject committees. Uh, can you, the Minister, commit the, to provide the, the relevant committees with the, uh, the summary of how many uh, consent notifications they might be expected to actually scrutinise to actually help them actually plan for their workload over the course of the next few months? Uh, to, uh, the answer is yes, but not quite yet. Uh, we are working our way through the nature of these 110 and where they would sit. That process has not been completed as yet, but as soon as we have that information, it will be shared with the committees and this committee. Okay, thank you. You okay? All right. Um, Alison. I really feel you were answering quite a lot of my questions yeah, sorry. there, sorry. to be honest. But, um, you know, back to these SSIs, you know, when does the Scottish Government intend to begin to lay them? Have you any more specific dates or do they all require to be considered by Brexit Day of the 29th of March? Stephen Jonah. I'll cover the first part and I get to, to cover the second part. So I think our, our, our feeling in the timing says that the, the first tranche will be SI notifications. So um, things where we think the UK government might be best placed to make the fix. And that's because, as I explained earlier on, we're effectively getting notification a month in advance and then put in, into their parliament. So we think September, October, November, the bulk of the work will be SI notifications and then transitioning into sort of November, December, January, um, where we think we'll get the bulk of SSIs. And as the Minister says, we're sort of keenly aware of last lane dates and want to do everything we can um, to get as much um, work done as early as we possibly can. Okay, yes, no, I would appreciate that. You asked about prioritisation. Um, there will have to be a process of prioritisation applied to these instruments. 
the way to think about this, I think, is not to focus on whether this is no deal prioritisation or not, but this is about March 2019 prioritisation. There will be a group of the fixes required that are absolutely essential to make, where, for example, a system of laws, a scheme or a field of regulation would be broken entirely if no preparations, no changes to the law were made in anticipation of EU withdrawal. And it is obviously proper that the government focuses on those areas first, given the scale and the pace of the legislating that, that I mentioned. So, for example, where you were talking about um, uh, an important regulatory function ceasing to be able to be exercisable, the government will be making, whether by notification to this parliament that a UK-wide approach is being taken, or whether by its own SSI, the government will be taking the steps required to address those deficiencies in legislation by March 2019. There will be other areas where Brexit has rendered a function, um, uh, has made it so that a function works in a different way, works in a suboptimal way, but continues effectively to operate. An example might be, and I should caution the committee, this is only an example, that for um, certain judicial posts currently can't be held by somebody if they're a judge of the European Court of Justice. Now, obviously, that doesn't make sense if, if, if the UK is no longer a member of the EU, but it isn't exactly a fatal blow to the scheme of judicial appointment. That may be a deprioritised fix, and they may well have to be addressed ultimately after whatever the um, important date is, whether that's March 2019 or later. OK, thank you. Well, just really going back to the consent notifications, I don't suppose you have a rough guess of how many would be applying to each various committee within this parliament? Well, I think that falls on from Mr McMillan's yeah. point. Right now, we don't. That's something we're working through. And as soon as we have that information, we will look to share that. Because I recognise that committees have to plan uh, their work programmes. So, um, as a, to risk of repeating myself, we absolutely will share that ASAP. Thank you. And... Mr McBratney, you, you mentioned uh, it's quite obviously there are uh, some pieces of legislation you, you actually you're going to have to do. Um, do you know the numbers there? Um, no, we don't have those sort of numbers at the moment. Um, the government intends to address all of the consequences of EU withdrawal. This is not about cutting off. The, the matters which will be addressed and those which won't be addressed, but this is about establishing the order of priority in which they're addressed. Clearly we'll commit to come back to the committee and following on from the earlier question with updates if that's what you would like and, and have that continuing dialogue. Yeah. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Mr Finlay? Um, How is this impacting on the normal work of government? Um, well, it would be unrealistic to, to suggest that it isn't impacting. Um, just as it won't, it would be unrealistic to suggest it won't impact on the work of the committees. Um, but we are applying as much resource as we can to dealing with this and being pragmatic and common sense in our approach. We're working with the UK government where that's appropriate to make the progress we need to. We'll bring forward SSIs as we need to do those. Um, so I, I would reassure Mr Finlay that we are coming at this with the best of intentions and the, the um, best efforts to minimise the impact on the work of the Parliament. Well, we see um, the same level of non-Brexit related instruments going through. Figures. Um, we, we're working through our information, so what we want to, to give the committee is not just the picture of what Brexit SI notifications and SSIs are coming, but all SSIs are coming through the system. So I think historically it's been about 200 to 300 domestic SSIs, if I can call them that, um, which come forward. Um, we have very preliminary information which suggests that if we continue as we um, currently plan to do, it's about the same volume again. Um, but have not had the chance to work out um, how those figures fit across individual committees or to go through a process of prioritisation in the same as we're doing with, with Brexit work. So that's a discussion we need to have um, with the Minister. But once we're able to show those projections to the committee, we, we intend to do so. So uh, you, you shouldn't see any big dip in that workload that we s we've seen previously? The, there are fluctuations across the SSI programme every year. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. And I think 
that is just a product of the type of work that, that we're bringing forward. But at the moment, it's it's looking similar to the previous years. And in terms of um, you know, the government uh, was provided with cash in order to um, prepare for Brexit. Um, where has that money gone? So, in, in, to pick up that point, the Chancellor um, set aside £1.5 billion uh, for additional funding uh, in each of the years 2018-19, uh, 2019-20. For the, uh, the Scottish Government received £37.3 million of consequentials for 2018-19. Uh, that's made up of 35.8 million resource, 1.6 million capital. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and uh, Fair Work has made initial allocations of 26.6 million resource and 0.5 million capital funding, which are supporting the preparation work that we're they're doing. And, you know, there'll be further announcements linked to the budget. Mm, yeah, that's a global figure, but what are we doing with the cash? Okay. Can we give examples of? Um, to be honest, that's not an area where we particularly get into more sort of delivery of legislative programmes. So I think that's something we would have to, to come back on if that's okay. We'll write back to the committee with as much information as we can. Okay. Is your question um, kind of related to staffing? Yeah, I mean the resources that we're, we're you know, are we, are we spending ten million on stamps? Are we spending them on lawyers? Are we spending them on you know? Policy experts, or you know, where is the money? Once, once the, the, the final details are announced in the budget, we can write uh, with that, provide that detail. Uh, in the meantime, I'll proceed to come back with any information I can that's helpful. Okay, thanks for that. Is that you, Mr. Finlay? Yeah. Okay. Tom? Thank you, convener, and good morning. And may I also take this opportunity to welcome the Minister to his new position. Um, clearly, there's been much discussion about instruments arising from the EU Withdrawal Act. I wonder if the Minister or his officials could update the Committee on any other Brexit-related legislative activity that will be forthcoming, such as from the Trade Bill. Okay. So, um, the main other area of activity is UK primary legislation, and obviously the Trade Bill is uh, currently before the Parliament and legislative consent memorandum uh, has been looked at. The, the next one um, is the Agriculture Bill, which the UK government has just um, introduced. We expect there will be more UK primary legislation relating to Brexit in the future, potentially the turn of the year. But we don't know exactly what that might be and exactly when it might come. Obviously, one example would be a fisheries bill, which I think the UK government said they're working on, but we don't have timings on that. And is there any expectations with regard to delegated powers which impinge upon devolved competencies within that legislation? The committee will be, from its consideration of the EU withdrawal bill, I'm sure familiar with the Scottish Government's position on delegated powers as it relates to preparations for EU withdrawal. The, the, the Government's position will be the same and it has been uh, expressed to the UK Government that where the similar issues arise in Brexit-related legislation, the expectation is that devolved competence will be respected when it comes to the allocation of delegated powers. And clearly from what we've learned from the, um, the EU Withdrawal Act is that the UK government's um, unwilling to respect um, devolved competencies when it does not regard that as being in the UK's interest. When this legislation is inevitably passed at Westminster, in terms of the uh, workload for this parliament on devolved areas potential uh, arising, such as SIs and SSIs, is there any understanding how that can impact upon the workload of the parliament and government? Again, simply point to the experience that this committee and other committees have had with the EU Withdrawal Bill and Act for, as an example of the way that the government is both seeking to protect the devolution settlement and in particular um, respect the role of this parliament while faced with the um, undoubtedly large practical challenge of making the necessary preparations for EU withdrawal. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll ask you about a slightly different thing you'll be relieved to hear. Um, you'll, you'll know, Minister, as a, as a former convener, that there's been a frustration uh, amongst uh, conveners uh, and, uh, and others uh, about the accessibility of some of the documents that we get relating to 
SSIs. Now, um, your predecessor committed to looking at this. I don't know how far he's got. Um, you'll also appreciate, and we're, we're in the same boat here as former journalists, um, uh, the need to present things in plain English. Uh, we often don't get that. So is that something you're committed to pursuing? Um, yes, I think uh, we've had several conversations with officials since I was appointed. Um, my predecessor, as you say, did commit to doing that and had done substantial groundwork in that area. I have very much reinforced that. Um, yeah, as a former convener, I share yours and other conveners' concerns about the um, nature of some of the explanatory notes that are overly explanatory at times and the lack of plain English. So there is um, some substantial work going on to try and ensure that um, we make this as easy as possible for committees. So, for example, what we're looking at is, in addition to what's contained within the instrument, would perhaps be uh, a covering letter that explains in two or three paragraphs specifically what the instrument does. Uh, and that's not to insult the intelligence of committee members, it's simply to be helpful, because I think we've all at times read explanatory notes and had to go back and reread them. It, it is a legitimate complaint that the committees have had, and it's something that we are uh, very much looking forward uh, to uh, fixing. Uh, I'm not going to sit here today and say we'll get this absolutely right in one go. So I would be, as Mr Fitzpatrick had indicated himself uh, previously, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say quite happy, because I like to think we would resolve this issue, but I'm certainly uh, willing and, uh, to hear from committees of any examples of uh, poor practice, if we could put it that way, poor presentations. So that allows us to focus in on that and look to improve the nature of the instruments and the way they're presented. So very much uh, hearing what you're saying on that issue. OK. Well, given that everything comes through this committee, I'm sure we can provide examples, but it's just to be helpful. We need to work together on this, I think. No, I, I, and in the spirit of constructive engagement, I completely uh, you know, commit to working with you on that. Um, and you know, if, if you've got something to draw my attention, do so. That's very useful. So I've got one final question. It's back to Brexit, I'm afraid. Um, um, so gi given the number of additional uh, Brexit-related instruments, are you, are you concerned that, um, that officials might... That, that might force officials to speed up drafting to get things through and that mistakes could occur? Um, I certainly hope not. And there's a lot of work going into ensuring that we don't see a dropping of standards through the workload. Um, human nature being what it is, people will make mistakes. It, it happens. We all do that. Um, but we're acutely aware of the stresses on the system to produce uh, good quality um, drafting. Um, so I, I, I can't sit here today and say there's not going to be any problems, and I wouldn't do that. But we are committed to, to getting this right, and um, you know, we will, we're putting as much resort and effort, resource and effort into to doing that. Do you want to come in on that? I've uh, given evidence to the committee before about um, improvements in the quality assurance mechanisms being applied inside government to the process of drafting. And I can uh, reassure the committee that there is no intention to compromise on any of them simply because of the Brexit workload. The same um, quality assurance processes that the committee has taken evidence about before will apply to every single Brexit instrument that comes before the committee. However, as the minister says, um, we are dealing with an unprecedented workload um, uh, and, and th that will inevitably have some consequences on the instruments that the committee sees. Maybe could we the approach just to get it right yeah. first time um, so that we're not tying up your time and ours having to revisit instruments. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Members have any other questions? No? Um, it's been a short session, but a useful one. Um, a sort of getting to know your session, if you can call it that. Um, so thank you for your time, uh, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly so that you can leave.
Right. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item three, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, no points have been raised on the draft renewables obligation Scotland amendment order 2018 and the draft early years assistant best start grant Scotland regulations 2018. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. Okay. Agenda item four, consideration of an instrument subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2018-267. Is the co committee content with this? Okay, and I'll move the meeting into private session.